this book, um, I'll just hold it up so our viewers can see what it looks like. Um, this book, Code on Trial, um, focuses on answering six um, questions, six very relevant and current questions uh, uh, to deal with, as you yourself refer to in the first chapter of your book, a court in crisis. Um, while we usually have anecdotal evidence, you have offered diagnoses and solutions based on um, analysis of um, years of data. It uh, looks like it was a Herculean task that involved work from uh, several law schools across the world, a lot of students, a lot of researchers. Um, it also seems from what I can find about your work online, that it is the culmination of um, several years of research into the Indian Supreme Court. Um, all three of you have already published several other papers with a focus on the judiciary. Um, so my first question to you is, why the Indian Supreme Court, especially for such a data-driven project? I mean, for me, it was an obvious choice. I researched the Supreme Court, um, something that I've been doing for um, many years now. But um, also, I think uh, it is, uh, you know, we, we, we call it the most important court in the world um, because of the kind of jurisdiction that it exercises over the number of people that it exercises jurisdiction over the kind of expansive jurisdiction that it has um, makes. And, 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 and there is, unfortunately, very little um, that we know empirically about the working of the court. Uh, it is a court whose um, you know, working and output is somewhat shrouded in mystery. Um, and so that's what we wanted to excavate. All right. I would just say that it's one of the most understudied courts in the world, looking right. from a global perspective. Um, my, one of my uh, former colleagues at Cornell, uh, Ted Eisenberg, who uh, was a pioneer in empirical studies of courts, um, was interested in looking at India precisely for this reason. And we co started to collaborate uh, and do that five years of data analysis, um, again, because he thought, wow, as Aparna said, a very important court, a court with wide jurisdiction, but a court uh, about which the inner workings of which is very little known. Right. Uh, was the uh, data uh, collection um, hard for you or was it freely available? Um, considering in India, we have the impression that uh, the data available publicly is not exactly the cleanest data, let's say. Well, I'll tell you, as uh, somebody who spent a lot of time in his career studying data on many different courts, uh, including courts in the United States, in Europe, in Taiwan, uh, India is no exception in terms of the difficulty that one encounters when trying to collect data, interpret the data, make sure the data is clean enough, really, to give clear answers to the questions that you want to ask. Uh, I'll say that um, it was years of work because the there wasn't, when we began this project, there simply weren't data sets that could answer the kinds of questions that we explore in this book. So we had to create them ourselves. And this project was begun uh, with um, Aparna and Sitel and Ted Eisenberg, who Sitel mentioned a moment ago, um, before his, his untimely passing. And it involved the reading of thousands of Indian Supreme Court judgments and creating a data set from scratch uh, through the use of our, our researchers and our team uh, so that we would have the kinds of data that would be able to answer these questions. We eventually added to that other data sets based on the biographies of the judges of the Supreme Court of India based on biographies of high court judges, uh, data based on uh, collecting every scrap of information we could pull from the website of the Supreme Court of India about when cases had been filed, how they had been concluded, and so on. So it really was taking data that didn't exist, or at least didn't exist in a form that would allow us to answer the questions that we wanted to ask, and and creating the data sets that will, would allow us to answer those questions. Oh, that, it's really impressive how you've presented it in the book as well. Um, you haven't complicated it much, but um, I saw that it was hand coded by researchers for many years. There were students who went through judgments 
um, back and forth. And I think that's amazing. Um, now, one of the issues you tackle head on in the book is the uh, backlog or the pendency problem, or as you uh, refer to it in the first chapter, the tariq pe tariq problem. Um, you hypothesize that the Supreme Court's current approach to uh, being a people's court might not be the most efficient way of being a people's court. Could you tell us a bit more about that and the solutions that you've suggested? So the hy hypothesis of the, the chapter is that, um, you know, too much uh, cases doesn't necessarily give people more justice. And the Supreme Court has taken that philosophy over time. It has increased, well, the number of judges have increased over time so that they can take more cases and um, give more decisions. They have oral hearings. They do things that um, many apex courts wouldn't entertain in the interest of their own time, right? The US Supreme Court, for example, will just often look at briefs and dismiss cases or decide to take them based on the briefs. Hearings are limited to a certain period of time. They don't go on endlessly. There's one hearing. And not that the U.S. Supreme Court has is the model, but I'm just giving an example of where their time is being spent, right? They're spending maybe seconds on decisions. So our, our hypothesis and our thought was that uh, it would they'd be better served if they took cases that will were, are more precedent setting, right? That would help high courts as well be able to dismiss cases more easily or say, hey, this case has already been decided. We don't need to rehear it. Instead, we're rehearing similar things. Another um, article by uh, uh, another um, researchers, right, have found that most Supreme Court decisions don't even cite precedent. There's just a narrow set you know, of the constitutional law that are looking at precedent. So this, there's this, there's this sort of Supreme Court aspect of the court, and then there's this run of the mill, almost high court or trial court aspect of the court that we think if they would invest their time in the more higher uh, appeals, that it would be better served. Right. Um, anything to add, uh, William Aparna? Um, I, I'll just add to say that, and just to buttress some of the points that Sikhil was making, um, this other study that she referenced found that the bulk of Supreme Court cases don't either cite precedent and in turn are never cited again also, right? So um, if you look at what they're doing, they're just resolving cases on the basis of facts. Now, um, the other thing that we found uh, was that, uh, again, a bulk of Supreme Court cases are the ones which, which they're taking, which they're admitting, are um, cases where both the all the lower courts have agreed on the outcome. Mm -hmm. And the court takes these cases and then is overwhelmingly, as what can be expected in these cases, likely to also agree with the lower courts. So mm -hmm. why is it then spending that much time? If you look overall, the court's filtering mechanisms um, don't seem to be working well. Their admission process don't seem to be working well because overall, if I remember correctly, I might be off by a few points here or there, but uh, overall, I think their rate of reversal of the previous court's judgment is about 57%, right? Okay. Just barely above 50%. So it's like a flip of a coin. Uh, so it's not very clear that they're doing a good job admitting these cases. And if you look at the bulk of cases that are coming out of high courts, uh, and then, uh, you know, potentially the pool that can go to the Supreme Court, obviously there are others that go to the Supreme Court, but even just focusing on the bulk of cases that are coming out of high courts. And you see how many of those cases the court is reversing. It's a very, very, very minuscule part. So it's not as if, you know, the bulk of high court cases, it, you know, matters can't really rest at the high court as if you need the Supreme Court to be intervening in all of these cases. Even when it does take these cases up, um, it hangs on to them for a long period of time and then generally tends to decide to not intervene. So if that's the case, it really needs to examine why it is taking the cases that it is taking um, and with what with what consequences, uh, both for its own workload and system systemically for questions around precedent, um, the clarity of the law, so on and so forth. Okay, William, anything to add? I think just to build on 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 that, 
the, the fundamental question about the role of the Supreme Court in, in society and the role of the Supreme Court of India in, the, in Indian society is, how do they bring justice? What, what, is it, what does justice mean in terms of the Supreme Court's duty to provide justice as a court, and not just as any court, but as the Supreme Court? One answer could be, well, we'll just take cases and we'll look at them just like every other judge looked at them and we'll decide them like any other judge and every other judge who has seen the case has decided them. That is justice, but it's justice in the same sense that a trial court gives justice or that a high court gives justice. And we might ask ourselves, what is supreme about the Supreme Court of India when that's the kind of justice it is dispensing? On the other hand, we might say the Supreme Court of India is in a unique position. It is in a special position that no other court can hold to provide the law of the land, to, to announce rules that other courts can follow in future cases, in hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands of future cases that might involve similar questions or similar legal problems. That's the unique power that a Supreme Court has. But the Supreme Court of India is so preoccupied in terms of the thousands, literally thousands of cases that it is taking and deciding every year that don't provide that kind of law giving guidance to all of the courts of India, that time is taken away from the court's ability to do that in the cases where it really can make that kind of a difference. And that's what we want to emphasize. And we we give the numbers. I mean, these are the numbers that we've we've been mentioning to you now and that you see in the book to kind of show with the data that how much of the court's time, its docket, its calendar are filled up with cases that ultimately aren't going to help all of the other courts of India provide more justice to all of the thousands, indeed millions of plaintiffs and defendants, landlords and tenants, yeah. uh, the accused, anybody who 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 seeks justice in the courts, all of those millions of people, they're not getting the benefit of the Supreme Court's guidance if the Supreme Court isn't providing that guidance uh, by selecting carefully the decisions where it really can make that difference. Right. I think you sum it up perfectly in the book where you say that access to the Supreme Court isn't necessarily access to justice.